Good morning, everyone. I'm back. Good morning, everyone. My name is not Kelly Ferris, but I am doing the Decades Game Show this morning. I'm the fill-in, all right? Okay, so if uh, you're just joining us for the first time in a couple of weeks, or if this is your first time visiting, let me just say we're glad to have you, and thanks for coming. And uh, I'll put a plug in that if you'll stop in at the welcome uh, station up front, pick up first-time uh, attender's gift, we'd like to give that to you, and just say thanks for coming. Uh, if you've been here, then you know that we've been covering a series called Decades over the last two weeks. And uh, to begin each service, what we have done is kind of created a little game show type activity where we bring up two very special people out of the congregation, of course, bring you up front, and we do a little game show talking about things within each decade. And uh, I think it would be just totally awesome if Ed and Angela Paver would join me this morning. Don't you think so? Don't you think so? Awesome. Of course, you know they are the parents of Bobby Paver. I just want to put that plug in. Oh, that's right. They do have a daughter. I'm, I'm just kidding you, Madison. Just kidding you. We like Madison a lot better anyway. All right. So this week, this week we're talking about pop culture. All right? Pop culture within these decades. So we're going we're to put a little twist on this. We're going to make this competitive, all right? We hear you guys are competitive. And um, I'm going to read off some clues, all right? And you answer the decade, you know, like 40s, 50s, whatever, as soon as you can. First one to guess it gets a point. Sound cool? All right. Here's your first clue. In this decade... 77% of households in America purchase their first television set. You're out. You're just out. You shouldn't have blown your first guess. All right. Ed, you're all alone on him, all right? Polio vaccine was introduced. Elvis came on the scene. Angela, shut up. <laughs> Would you like to guess, Ed? <laughs> Sock hops, Ed. All right, Angela guessed it correctly, but it was only after she guessed it incorrectly, so no points for you! All right, let's move on and hope we can get a little better here. All right. This decade, are you ready now? All right, be really sure you know the answer before you guess, all right? This decade was known as a roaring decade. Ed Paver! All right. Let's do another one. Peace and love. Yes, you're good. That was awesome. Well, get ready, Ed. She's... All right, one, one, uno a uno, all right? During this decade, MTV became very popular. Yeah, come on. Dos y uno. All right. Um, Ed, you're, I know you're going to get this one because I've seen you do the jitterbug. That's wrong, Ed. <laughs> the Howdy Doody show was popular. Aluminum foil and the slinky were invented. You're wrong again, Ed. And to that, I'm going to say, don't say anything else. Let Angela guess. You got a guess? All right. No points for you. Okay, we'll go back here. During this decade, women's clothing styles changed, and they were known as flappers. Nope. Ed, very good. Oh, I got two to two. Two to two here. Okay. 
Two to two, we got to have a tiebreaker. You ready? Can I get a drum roll? Thank you very much. Let me get a good one here. Ah, nighttime soaps became popular during this decade, Dallas and Dynasty. It was the 80s. The 80s. The 80s. Very good, Angela. Angela wins 3-2. She smoked him. Give it up for Angela. Very good. Very good. You won. Thank you. What's that? No. <laughs> I tell you what. Yeah, you can't get. Ed, there's two boxes back there with Tom on them. Help yourself to those on the way out. That's your consolation prize. All right, hey, welcome to Crosspoint. We're glad to see you here. We got a short video, and then we're going to have the welcome. How are we doing? We good? Good. That's great. All right, I'm going to try this again. So, um, happy Labor Day. I guess you don't say happy Labor Day back? Okay. Um, I think it's kind of, I, okay. I really have tried all morning. <laughs> to figure out <laughs> how I could make a Labor Day joke work. <laughs> and I've got nothing. <laughs> and this is the best that I've got so far, that I think it's really unfair that mothers get two holidays, but fathers just get Father's Day. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. On a uh, funnier note, uh, Logan Pickerel, why don't you stand up? Logan's got a mustache. Why don't you show everybody your mustache? <laughs> That's what I need. I need every week for when my jokes bomb, just a well-placed whatever. <laughs> so, okay, hey, if it's your first time here and you're not completely freaked out by now, we're glad that you're joining us this morning at Crosspoint. Uh, we have a free gift for you at the welcome table. Um, it's, it's okay. It's really just, we're just trying to entice you because we want to say hi and get to know you. So, um, but that's at the welcome table. Uh, that video that we showed, um, if you have never been to Kid Stuff, Kid Stuff is our family worship experience. Um, I really can't describe it. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's about 45 minutes. Um, you'll be talking about it with your kids for the rest of the week. It's completely, almost completely run by our students at the church. And uh, we start, we take summers off during the kid, um, summers off during the kid stuff kid stuff off during the summers and this is our first kid stuff of the season starting next sunday and we are paying our respects to summer so that'll be next sunday and also next sunday um in the morning uh we're just going to have a one week uh sermon series called the amazing story of hope that will be an awesome sunday for you to bring a friend to and um i would just want to encourage you do not be late. So if you come early, make sure you are here right by 9.15. And if you come second service, make sure you are here right by 10.45 because you won't want to miss the start of that service. And um, today we are wrapping up our series decade. Um, for these past three weeks, we've been talking about what is our prayer for our church over the next 10 years. Um, not where do we want to be, who do we want to be as a group of people. And so um, we've kind of gone through that um, two parts now. And Tammy Conrad is going to bring the message today in terms of what's her prayer for our church in 10 years. And that's all I've got. So stand and make a Labor Day joke to someone around you that was better than mine. Or point at Logan's mustache. Well, good morning. It's so nice to be here with you. And uh, Kevin, did your wife really think that labor story was funny? She never thinks I'm funny. <laughs> well, happy Labor Day. And in honor of Labor Day, I wore my white pants. Anybody else? Last chance for the white pants, right? Right? So you got to get the white pants on. I don't like white pants, but you got to wear them because it's your last chance, right? So anyway, happy Labor Day to you. I hope you have some wonderful plans that don't involve 24 hours of softball, just saying. Anyway, um, so I am talking about what we would like the church to be or what we dream the church would be in 10 years. Now, I, I, I have to preface this because we had our first meeting in the pool best meeting ever, by the way. <laughs> this is the first meeting we've ever had in the pool, but it was a pool meeting. And Kevin said, I want you to dream about what you want the church to look like in 10 years. Okay, I have to just, just admit this right on the table. My first thought and the thing that I got the most excited about at that moment was omelet bar. Right? I mean, how cool would 
sausage, bacon, spinach to be healthy. Cheese, omelet bar, right there. We've got the facilities. I think this would be amazing. I mean, cappuccino machine, because regular coffee, come on. Ever, when they tell you that you have to grow to like the stuff, it's why bother, right? Cappuccino, lots of sugar, lots of cream. That's the good stuff. You can bring it into church with you. Right? Good dream? I'm liking it. I promise I will get more spiritual, but that really is truly where my mind went first, that omelet bar would be the best thing ever. And then I started thinking about my specific area of ministry, because that's how it would affect me. And I'm kind of supposed to be talking about the environment, and that's, you know, I, I'm head of the creative team. And so I kind of come up with, with set design, some of the fun stuff, that, not personally, we have a team. I don't want to take all the credit at all, because it's mostly this wonderful team that I have. And they do all this great, come up with creative ideas and this and that. And I'm thinking, oh, 10 years from now, we're going to be in that new section over there. It's going to be amazing. The sound is going to be incredible. We are going to have a team of people that just deals with sets. We're going to have a builder, a dreamer, a designer, and they are going to completely build out a set for each sermon series. And people are going to walk in and go, oh. Then the band is going to be so good that we may only have them every other week because they're on tour. Okay, so, and the drama is just going to impact people's lives because it's amazing, and everything is going to be incredible. And that was my dream for the 10 years. So then I picked up the Bible and tried to find that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's not there. <laughs> um, so then I'm like, so how am I going to fit my dreams, God, into what you have designed for the church. And so I went to, as I look at the church, I said, what he really wants from us is unity, right? He wants us to all be unified. Because in all honesty, if I took a poll and I said, what are your, what's your dream for the church 10 years from now? I bet I would have at least 100 different ideas about what your dream that the church should be 10 years from now. And, and I'm thinking that it would be as varied as you can even imagine. And that is where our mind is. That's where the church should be 10 years from now. Church should be there. So because we all have all these opinions, all these ideas, all these thoughts, then what God desires from us is unity. So that's where I'm going to start. So I'm thinking, I remember reading a lot about unity in Ephesians. So I started in Ephesians, and I read Ephesians, because I mean, I know it has like body of Christ, you know, the hands, the feet, the arms, and all that. And it has like, I know it has all that marriage stuff in it. And, uh, you know, and the servants and the, and the masters. And, and so, I'm, I mean, I know that it kind of has all that in it. That's probably a good place to start. I got nothing. I got nothing. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Let's go on to Philippians and let's see what God might have to say. And so I head into Philippians chapter 1. Pretty good. And then chapter 2 hit. And I love how Paul starts off chapter 2. Because he wants to find some point of unity, some point of togetherness with this group of, ch this church in Philippi. And so he says, if any of you have experienced this, I want you to say, uh-huh, let's try it, uh-huh. Okay, you got it, you got it. I can't sit, I'm sorry. Okay, so if, so we're going to try to find one point that we can all agree on, okay? So if any of you experienced delicious donuts on the way in here. I want to hear an aha. Uh -huh. mm, not many donuts. All right, let's see if we can find something else. Um, if any of you are glad that you do not have to wear a suit and tie to come to church, say uh-huh. Uh -huh. Oh, we're getting there. We're getting there. A little more unity there. If anyone really liked that first song. Uh -huh. All right, we're getting there. It's getting some unity here. All right. If anyone is really glad that we're in chairs instead of bleachers. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's some unity right there. We're back for volleyball games. I'm like, how did we do this? Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. And it just didn't seem that bad then. Isn't that great? Um, so let's look at verse one. If anyone has had fellowship with Jesus Christ. If anyone has had encouragement from Jesus Christ. If any comfort from his love. Is there anyone here that's experienced any comfort from Jesus Christ's love? 
All right. If any fellowship with the Spirit, are we dropping out? Has anyone experienced any tenderness and compassion? Okay, let's try. Has anyone experienced the joy and wonder of Jesus Christ? Oh, good, good. We've got some unity going. He goes on to say, if we can agree on that. Oh, whoops, I turned. Sorry. <laughs> then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. So, we got all that? Being in mind, one spirit and purpose. We like donuts and we're glad we're in chairs and we love Jesus. Amen. <laughs> then he has the nerve to go on. And these next words, I don't know if you've ever been reading the Bible and scripture actually comes up out of the page and grabs you by the neck and pulls you back down. Has anybody ever experienced that? Okay, well, that kind of happened here. And it's really simple. I mean, what he says is nothing, nothing profound. As a matter of fact, I've heard it a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Like, he says it a lot in all these letters. Jesus says it a lot in scripture. And for some reason, when I read it in the context of unity, it was profound. His words are, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. Well, I don't really consider myself a selfish person. I mean, I, I feel like I give to a lot of people and, and um, I just, I don't consider that as my, as my character. But I can tell you who is. <laughs> I live with one. <laughs> I live with somebody that, anybody else here live with somebody that's extremely selfish? I know you're scared to raise your hand because I know, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And that's because it's so much easier to see in someone else than it is to see in yourself. I can pick out all sorts of selfishness in all sorts of other people. And in myself, I'm delightful. <laughs> <laughs> and then, when scripture grabs a hold of you, you begin to see yourself for who you really are. And... I picture myself when I'm becoming selfish. Um, you know, I'm like, well, when have I been selfish? No, 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 no. What, 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 when did that happen? And I, I kind of picture myself as like just kind of growing big inside. Like that. Like a peacock opens its feathers. You know? And um, I kind of use a lot of words like I and me. I don't deserve that. I deserve that. Doesn't anyone know how busy I am? No one knows how hard I work. They don't have the right to treat me that way. And I realize that my selfishness is right there in my face. And I didn't even know it. How did that happen? I mean, it's not like we haven't heard about it. What, two months ago, Kevin preached on it in the marriage series. Four weeks on selfishness. Couldn't I have gotten it then? Or last week, Bobby mentioned it. Bobby mentioned his sermon. I'm like, oh, great. There's mine right there in two sentences. And, uh, and God said, oh, no, 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 no. I've got more to deal with because selfishness is so hard. And it's so easy to fall into that because we want what we want. We want what we desire. And sometimes we don't even know that it's at the exclusion of others. I, uh, I think it hit me full face when we were on the mission trip. And uh, we were in one of Schultz's two-hour marathon devotions. And uh, yeah, yeah, it, at least two hours. Sometimes it was two and a half. He said all good things. I'm, I'm not complaining. He said all good things. But he said something, and, and I'm not sure if he's done extensive research on the subject. I'm not sure if he heard it in Bible college and it's law. But he said the root of all sin begins with selfishness. Really? I'd never heard that, really. I mean, I knew selfishness was kind of a big issue. But the root of all sin is selfishness. And I got to thinking, oh, well, gossip, you know, I, that means that you enjoy the thrill of talking about somebody else or having news above that other person. 
Judging, you're kind of putting yourself above somebody else. Um, jealousy, you're kind of making yourself to be more important than what's going on. Um, wow. Wow, you know, I mean, robbery, and you know, all the biggies, we can kind of understand why that's selfishness. Oh, wow. Selfishness is at the base of all sin. And the thing is, is sometimes we don't even realize we're being selfish. We're just being us. Because our human nature is to be about us, right? I mean, I have teenagers in the house. How many times have I said, the world does not revolve around you? A lot. Just saying. A lot. So God has to deal with our selfishness. And I love what, I'm, I'm using the New Living Translation, and so it won't be up there because I love how straight to the point he is. I even had to grab my kid's Bible because I didn't have one. Oops, the back's gone. So anyway, don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. But I like making a good impression on others. I like it when people like me. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think about only your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. Wow. Wow. I have to tell you, that hit me hard. Don't think about just what I'm doing. Think about others, too. Because you know what? I'm doing a lot, and that requires a lot of my thought process. <laughs> I'm just saying. Think about others. Don't be selfish. Be humble. That's tough stuff. That's really tough stuff. I, I, I don't want to do that. I, I, I don't. I want to be comfortable. I want to be happy. And I want to be well-liked. I love what C.S. Lewis says. And C.S. Lewis is the guy that wrote Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, that whole series. And the, the thing that I love about his perspective, he became a, a great theologian in England, is that he started from the basis of being an atheist. So he started from not believing in God at all and made this journey of complete and total surrender to Jesus Christ. And so his, um, what he has to say is awesome because it comes from such a different perspective than like me, who's grown up in the church my whole life. Now, how he became a Christian is because he became really good friends with um, Tolkien, who is the guy that wrote The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And Tolkien had always been a Christian. At least, you know, I don't know his salvation story. You can look that up and let me know what that is. But at least as long as he knew C.S. Lewis. And they became really good friends. Okay, now this has nothing to do with the sermon, but it is so cool. When I was in England last year, we walked the steps. We sat in the seats that they would sit in and talk and discuss all this stuff. So cool. I saw his door, and it had like a lion, right? Lion, which in the wardrobe on it. It had this big lion knocker on the door. <gasps> it was cool. Okay, so back. Sorry. C.S. Lewis has such amazing things to say, and he says this about, being, about humility. And he says this in the book that he wrote called Mere Christianity. And he said, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. Doesn't that sound like so? I can, I think, tell him the full step. <laughs> the first step is to admit that one is proud. It took uh, how many degrees to come up with that? But it's hard. The first step is to admit that I'm selfish to admit that I want what I want, to admit that I'm proud, to admit that I don't sometimes like humility. He said that is the biggest step. To admit. Is, have we heard that before, right? Step number one, admit that you have a problem. Who knew they got that from C.S. Lewis, right? So admit, you know what? I have a selfish issue. I like things to be about me. Have you ever been with a story and you're like, oh, my story's a lot more interesting than that? <laughs> you know? Because we like it to be about me. So how do we deal with this? Scripture goes on. Again, I'm in the New Living Testament, so it won't be up there. He said, Paul says, your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Okay. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Jesus is God, 
But he didn't cling to that. He instead made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on a cross. He had everything. He was, before the world began, he was everything. He was God. Jesus was God. He had all of the same rights, the same privileges, the same awesomeness. And he chose to come down here as a humble servant. And if you know scripture at all, you know how horribly he got treated while he was here. Horrible. And he chose that. He chose to die on a cross. Wow. It wasn't like God said, this is what you need to do. He chose the downward path. And then it goes on. Oh, look at me getting old. Whew. Because of this, God raised him up for, to the heights of heaven and gave him a name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Everywhere in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Everywhere. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He chose to become nothing and became everything. He chose down and received it all. That math is so confusing. God's math. You choose down to be great. So greatness is defined completely different in God's eyes. Greatness is being one of his. Greatness is being a passionate follower of Christ. Greatness is being used of him. How can I be used of him? I have to make the decision to give up on myself. Now, I, um, I struggle with this, so I've prayed a lot. Lord, I surrender myself. I surrender myself. We sang about it a lot. You know, I lay, uh, last week, I lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Um, several songs. I surrender. I lay me down. I choose the path down so I can be great in your kingdom. And that's, that's huge. I want to I read something. I, uh, I would love to say that I coined the phrase descending into greatness but it was Bill Hybels, so I, you know. He wrote this book, Descending into Greatness. Bill Hybels is a church of, this huge church, and uh, he said humbleness was, was something that he's always struggled with, and so that is why this, this meant. And so, anyway, he starts with descending into greatness, and he says, down is a word for losers. Who here likes to lose? Yeah, me neither. I hate losing. I mean, in my mind, when I play a game and I lose, I take the board and I throw it, and I'm like, you're all losers anyway! I don't actually do that. But in my mind, I'm doing that, because I really like to win. And then I have to explain away why I'm losing. Well, it's because th th that number hasn't been rolled. It's because this hasn't happened. It's, it's just, it's not because that I'm faulty in any way. I have to explain away my losing, because I hate to lose. As a matter of fact, I, we, we play games with Kevin and Bethany a lot. Kevin and Bethany Jack, and um, we played, and there's this card game we play, it's called Liverpool Rummy, and it's a rummy game, so sets and runs, and um, you can steal cards from other players if your turn is coming up next. I just have to preface this, that it was getting kind of late, and I was fairly far behind, and I had a great hand, and I just needed one card, okay? One card, and I was going to win it all, and I'm starting to, this one card, it's going to come, it's going to come, I just know it, I know it, and so, it gets discarded. And I'm like, I want that. And Bethany, who's sitting ahead of me, and she goes, I want that. How bad do you really need that card, Bethany? I need it pretty bad. I don't think you need it as bad as I do. She goes, yeah, yeah, I, I need it pretty bad. Okay, so I looked at our beautiful, lovely pastor's wife, this sweet, gentle woman, and I said, selfish jerk! <laughs> I didn't say that in my head. I really did say it. And I meant it. 
I, I meant every word. And so then, uh, you know, it comes back, and you're like, oh, wow, that was kind of ugly. <laughs> Bethany, I'm really sorry I called you a selfish... I, I even texted it. I didn't even call her. <laughs> she might have been asleep, you know. I didn't want to wake her up. So, uh, so I texted her. I'm really sorry. That was kind of uncalled for. None of us want to lose. It goes against who we are. It goes against our human nature. I don't want to lose. All right. That is what Philippians 2 says. Down is a word... For, down is a word for losers. But God is calling on Christians to develop the discipline of losing. If you want to, discipline of losing. So it, it's something that it doesn't just come naturally. I just thought I'd point that out. If you want to follow me, God says, follow the example of my son who lost not just a little, nor even a lot, but lost everything. I love this. Such a call does not paint a picture of men and women drained and empty, devoid of personality and energy. He doesn't call us to give up what he's gifted us with. I love it. God's call to lose for his sake doesn't mean we deny the legitimate needs of our human frame or the desires and passions he has placed within us. When Jesus was on this earth, he took care of his spiritual needs. He took care of his physical needs. He went away for his emotional needs, for his to be time away. He took care of that. It wasn't that he gave all of that away. Jesus took care of himself physically, emotionally, and he challenged his followers to embrace their uniqueness and pursue the dreams that God had given them. But losing does mean, oh, oh that we allow God to determine what needs are legitimate. Losing means you, we, that we yield our desires and passions to his guidance. We invite him in to chip away the rough edges of our personalities and to use the gifts that he's given us without seeking applause and to allow him to conform our dreams to his will. No omelet bar? <laughs> Allow him to control our dreams to his will. Such losing is not easy. It requires a singular focus on Jesus Christ, an unwavering passion and love for God and the advancement of his kingdom. An unwavering love and passion for God and a passion for the advancement of his kingdom. I love that. Greatness is an unwavering love for Jesus Christ and who he is and a passion that you want everybody involved in that. And then I got to looking at the opposite of what selfishness was. And, and as I looked at scripture and as I looked that, that, you know, God gave up everything, which is an unselfish move, but that wasn't his motivation. That wasn't why he did that. He didn't give it up to gain everything. He gave it up because he loves us. He gave it up because of his abounding and wonderful love for each and every one of us. It wasn't because it was like, oh, it's the unselfish thing to do. Because I think sometimes we look at selfishness, and the opposite of that would be giving or unselfish. But when I look at that scripture passage, the opposite of do not be selfish is abundant love. Abounding love. Abounding love that made Jesus Christ give up everything, come down to this earth for us. An abounding love that allows us to be transformed to love like he does. An abounding love that allows others to be transformed by that love. And an abounding love that allows this church to be transformed into a church of love. And that, I believe, is what it means to descend. Is to give up my selfish desires because of my abounding love for Christ's kingdom and for people around me. I, when, when I look at our church, we've we structure our church on Sunday mornings to reach out to the non-believer because that's our passion. Our passion is that God's kingdom would grow and that, that, that we would see new believers in Christ all the time. 
And so we structure our services to really meet that, to, to, to reach out to the non-believer, to the visitor. And so we do a lot of things, probably not my preference. If we ever do a country song in here, my smile will be completely fake. Okay? It's just the way it is. But I will try to find something in there that brings me closer to God. So as I look at our services, it's not about what I desire, but what I desire for God's kingdom. And that is such a huge shift, and it's not easy. When I look at what I want our prayer for the church to be, I want it to be an abounding love. How do I get that? Because you know what? My human nature is selfishness. My human nature is to protect myself. My human nature is to defend myself and to make sure that above all else, I am not slighted, right? I mean, that is my human nature. I, I don't think I'm alone in that. And so to show abounding love, it's got to come from above. It's got to be, God, Lord, show me how to love those around me. Because you know what? There's some pretty unlovable people. It's just fact. I may be one of them sometimes. My husband will probably tell you I am sometimes. How do I learn to love them? I had a friend call me this week, and she said, I am tired of it. I am tired of putting myself out there for those people because they never respond back. I say hi, they don't say hi back. I try to initiate a conversation, and they walk right by me. She goes, and I am done trying. Don't you think that's right? Uh, two weeks ago, I probably would have said, you are right, you go girl. But I've been studying for this. And you know what? It's not, I know, that's not what God calls us to do. He calls us to sacrifice with an abounding love. He calls us to continue to mend that relationship, even if it's not deserved. He calls us to continue seeking that person out. Because you know what? I know I do not want to be the person that stands in the way of between them and Christ. I don't want to be that person. I want to be great in God's eyes. And that means I sacrifice myself. That means I sacrifice my unjustness to reach out and love to this whoever to glorify God's kingdom. That's hard. That's really hard. How does that look like in our church? Um, I, I did ask if I could use this story for Paul. Uh, my husband Paul, not the writer Paul. I, I know that gets kind of confusing sometimes. Uh, my husband Paul, he has had a passion to lead worship for a really long time. That is his passion. He loves it. He feels like that is God's calling on his life. And for this last year, that is not what he's been doing. And he's felt slighted. He really has. And he has felt that this is my calling and nobody sees it and, and why can't I do what I feel like God's calling me to do? And why am I not being used as this way? And I have to tell you, sometimes it got a little toddlery. But it was my job! I liked doing that! He didn't quite do that. I'm a little more expressive than he is. But it kind of was that, because our inner child kind of comes out when we're feeling slighted and when we're hurt and all that stuff, and we want to be important. Two weeks ago, we had this worship meeting um, before service, and two weeks ago, Paul sat here in this front step, and he said, I just have to tell you, God's really been dealing with me. And uh, he said, I, he didn't say the word humility, but that was what was oozing out of every single thing he said. He said, you know, I love being up here leading worship, but God's called me somewhere else. And I just have to do my best in that, I'm sorry, I just have to do my best in that calling. Even though it may not be where my, where my desire is right now, my greatness is in who God is. And I am gonna bow to that, even if it's not what I want to do. And I think I was sobbing sitting right there, because I mean, it's, it's been hard. It's hard giving up something that you love to do. That descending thing? Ooh. But when we descend, when we give up our selfish stuff, God's kingdom be glorified. 
I, uh, I think that sometimes some of that stuff is kind of easy to pick out when we're being selfish. I want us to have an abounding love for even those people that we haven't met yet. And um, that, that kind of came to me recently. We went on vacation in Florida. And we were at Cocoa Beach, it was Surf City, dude, you know, it was awesome with waves. And it was fun. We were having a great time. But I love to go to different churches. I like to see how they do things. I like to see how they structure their worship, what things they add, what things they don't have. Um, I really like to see how other churches operate and function. So we decided we were going to go, and I did my research. I mean, they had, like, surfboards on the website. They have this great surfboard ministry. And I thought, this is going to be fun. So we get there. And... I was like, Mary Beth is looking at me. Um, and I have to tell you, being a visitor is tough. I, 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 uh, you know, I've been in church my whole life, and uh, I forgot, because, I, I don't know, I, for some reason, being here, being a visitor was tough, because there were tons of people coming in and out, and we have no clue. There's no, like, entrance sign, and, and it's like this older church, but they built on two other buildings off this way. There's another building off this way. And I don't think it's any bigger than this complex here, but it was just all spread out in different buildings. And I was just kind of looking around, and I saw this guy with the Bible talking with several people there, and I figure, he kind of knows what's going on. So I go up, and I'm like, um, how, how do you get to the, the sanctuary? And he goes, oh, okay, okay. Now, I need to pause right here, because I am here with my four kids, so those of you that don't know me, I have, it's Paul and me, and I have four kids. Three of them are teenagers. One just graduated, junior, freshman, and I have a sixth grader. And she looks like she's probably in fifth grade. She's not here, so I can say that, okay? So she looks young. And so I have all of these kids, and my mom's with me, and I say, where's the sanctuary? He goes, oh, okay, well, get this. Okay, you have to walk up the stairs, the outside stairs, then you walk down a little few stairs, you go down this hallway, you make a right at the end of the hallway, and then you go up another set of stairs, and then you're in the sanctuary. I'm glad it's easy, thanks. <laughs> so then I get up there and I'm thinking, well, maybe they have a children's church, I don't know for sure. So we sit down there, we take up a whole pew, okay, because there's seven of us. And I'm looking, oh, there is children's church. Mallory, would you like to go to children's church? Yeah, I think I would. Okay, so I go back out, I find an usher and I'm like, um, can you tell me where children's church is? And she goes, yeah, you need to go through those doors, which are, there's one here, and there's one here at the front of the sanctuary. You need to go through those doors at the front of the sanctuary, and you go down the stairs, and then they go out the building, and you go down to the second building on the left, and that's where the children's department is. Okay, let me tell you, it was right where I was when I asked the guy where the sanctuary was. Could he not see that I had children? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> could he not see that I had children, that I could have used that information when I was right there? And so I'm thinking, this is a great church experience. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I dropped Mallory off. I'm, Have fun, sweetie. Got my number because of, you know, all of the stuff. And so then I'm, I talked to this lady. She's very, very nice. I want to know how to get back in the church like how I came in at the beginning because I do not want to come in. Church has started. And I do not want to come in at the front of the church and walk in. I do not think this is too much to ask for a visitor. I really don't. Nobody wants to do that. And she goes, oh, it'll be fine. Oh, it's good, okay, okay. And I said it three times because I wasn't sure she was really listening to me. Three times I said, I do not want to come through that door up there at the front. I would like, I know there's doors at the back because I came through them once, but I have no clue how to get back there. <laughs> and so she said, oh, you just come with me, just come with me, yeah, okay, okay. You know where she took me, don't you? Yes, she did. And I said, these are the front doors. She goes, oh, but it's okay. I've got to go in too. I'm like, yeah, but you go here. You know, and so we waited until they were at least greeting. And so they were greeting, and so I slipped in. And I have to tell you, they loved each other. They had great fellowship with one another. It, it was great to see. But that's all we experienced. And I'm telling you, we're big people. It's hard to miss us on a, on a whole pew and only one person greeted us. So it was a long time of greeting, and we're standing there, and I look down at Paul, and I go. <laughs> and everybody around us is hugging and loving, and they are great, and they have a great fellowship with one another. But it's a little exclusive. I have to tell you, it, it was a little exclusive. And the service was great. I, it, it, the songs were a little retro, I Walk By Faith, you know, it was still good. They were still great songs, we still worshiped. Sir, the guy, I, I love the preacher. He like came out and he had like the Hawaiian shirt. I don't think he had shoes on. 
I mean, he, I mean, tan as tan can be. Dudes, how's the week yet? <laughs> yeah, he was fun. He was great. What he said, incredibly insightful. Really amazing. But I didn't feel any love. I was sitting there. Okay, and they even, oh, I forgot about this part. They even had a dinner. They were having a dinner. Okay, now if you're having a church dinner, I'm thinking hamburger, hot dogs, something like that, right? Okay, you know what they were having? Sausage and peppers. <laughs> really? Like, that's not going to decrease the, the attendance on that dinner. I'm like, come on, get out the burgers and dogs, right? This is a beach kind of thing. No, sausage and peppers. But not one person invited us to stay for dinner. Now, he invited from the, from the sanctuary, but we didn't know anybody. Not one person invited us to stay for dinner. Not like we would have, but, you know, it's nice to get the invite, right? Wow, my eyes were completely opened. Completely opened. How many times have I selfishly just gone around to the people I know in church? Because that's comfortable. That's who I know. That's what I want. Like. And if you're a visitor and that's happened, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I didn't even know. And my eyes were completely opened. Because I have to give up my desires. I have to give up what I want. I have to give up. I have to lay me down so Christ's kingdom can become great. Because I have a passion for Christ's kingdom. I have a passion that this church become great. I, uh, I love the scripture verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. And it says, If I have the voice of men and of angels, but I have not love, then I am a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. And I have to tell you, I'm a preschool music teacher, so I know what a clanging cymbal sounds like. And it's annoying. Over. And all the kids want to play the thing. We have to take turns playing that stupid cymbal. So I hear it a lot. And it's just noise. It is just noise. So if I have the best words in the world, if we have the best band that there ever was, if our set design is incredible, if we have the most powerful service, but we don't have love, we are a clanging cymbal and a resounding gong. Oh, I don't want to be a clanging cymbal. I want my passion and love for God to supersede everything else. I want that to be your challenge today. I want you to look at yourselves and I want God to allow God to look at you and say, you know what? What do I need to give up? What is standing in the way of me having abundant love from everyone? A love that doesn't come from myself, but only from you. Because I want to be great in your eyes and I want to be great in your kingdom. And that means I have to lose myself along the way. A lot of you, use, you to use my gifts, my abilities, my weaknesses for your greatness. I, uh, I'm, for my prayer for the church, goes back to um, Philippians 1, 9. And it's Paul's prayer for the church in Philippi. And he said, and my prayer for you is this, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. As I grow to know who you are more and more, my eyes will become opened to how I need to love. My insight will change. My desires will change. My love will change. May your love abound more and more. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, this is so hard giving up ourselves when it's so unnatural. But that is, that is our desire. Lord Jesus, that you come in, that you take our lives, that we allow ourselves to be laid down, and that you're able to use us for your greatness. Lord Jesus, I pray for this church in the next 10 years. Lord, I pray that, that, that we will become great for you 
that our passion and our love just supersedes everything else because we want everyone to be compassionate followers of you, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in your holy, precious name. Amen. There's this um, incredible prayer in uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 that uh, Solomon prays. And the uh, background to the prayer, if I can give it to you, is... Um, David, David, who slayed Goliath, who was king of Israel, who did all these amazing things, um, he wanted to build a temple for God. And he had these incredible plans and this great desire to build this temple for God. And um, it gets near to the end of his life, and he's ready to do it. And God says, no, you're not the one who's going to do it. Your son's going to do it. And so um, he does this thing where he basically sets everything up for greater success for the next generation, which we could have a whole series on that in and of itself. But he sets it up for his son Solomon to be able to build the temple. So his son Solomon goes, and he builds this amazing amazing temple for God. Like, people still talk about the specs and everything that went into it today, because it was so incredible. And um, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon gathers the entire nation of Israel, all of God's people together, and he prays this prayer. He prays this, like, it's in your Bible, it's in 1 Kings chapter 8, if you want to look it up later. Um, it's amazing it's unbelievably long. <laughs> like, I mean, he, because, I mean, he was feeling this, and he had all these different things that he was requesting God. And um, it, it's really interesting how this flows, because when he gets done with praying his prayer, then he stands up and he addresses the nation of Israel. Still in prayer, but he kind of does one of those um, information prayers. You know what I'm talking about? The information prayers, you usually only hear them in church, where it's like they're praying to God, but they're really just communicating information, like, Lord, I ask that you be with us at our services next Sunday at 10.45 and 9.15, if anyone wants to show. I actually had a pastor in a church one time. Um, he, we were a small church, and um, he, uh, he wanted people to go visit this lady who was in the hospital. And so he had talked a lot in the welcome and other stuff that he wanted people to go visit this lady in the hospital. And then he prays this prayer at the end of service, and he goes, Lord, I ask that you be with Sister Mary Louise Templeton, or I, I don't know what her name was. And he goes, I ask that you be with her on floor three of the Christ Hospital, room 325. And Lord, you know she's just down that hall in the nook. If you go to the benches, you're too far, Lord. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say that part. <laughs> but I mean, like, he, he just had these very important prayers. And he's like, well, what's going on? And so, so Solomon prays this prayer. And then he prays the informative prayer that's addressing the people. And then he says this, and you'll see his heart come out. He says, and may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need. And this is what's striking to me about that. He prays a prayer, and then he prays another prayer that God would remember his prayer. And he goes, God, it's like he's going, I care so much about this. Don't let this drift away. And so we've said we've got three prayers for our church right now. We said the one further out, and they kind of all happen together, but there's some steps along the way, is that we would go. That we would not view what happens at our church as an ending. We would not view it as a destination, but we would view it as the start of something. That we would be a launching pad into the community of hope and of love to make a difference. That we would go. And in order to get to that point, what Bobby talked about last week is we've got to mature. Now, that's not saying... We're immature, but it's saying that you need to, we need to move to different levels of maturity. We need to move of levels of maturity from simply I care about God and what he does in my life to Christ makes all the difference in my life to Christ's love is so overwhelming and so compelling that I have to help others. That for those of us who have been shepherded, who have been cared for, that we would become the shepherds. And in order for that to happen... We've got to pray, and we've got to become the people that Tammy talked about today. That we wouldn't be selfish, but that we would love. That we wouldn't be about us and our needs and our desires, but that we would be so overwhelmed with love that we would do whatever it took to reach those and get them into a relationship with Christ. And I want to share one story on that, and I'm, I'm going to embarrass him, um, and I didn't ask permission um, because I don't do that. 
um, but it, when our small group um, first started, uh, it was really interesting because some of us knew each other. We started meeting the very first session that we did small groups, and um, some of us kind of knew each other. A lot of us, we just had waved or something like that. And so we get together the first night in small group, and over the next couple weeks, um, Luke Malone, who's in our group, um, he had all these different questions because he didn't know how we did groups, and he's like, so are we going to add people? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? And we go, well, Luke, I mean, if we want to invite people, we can. Um, and he's like, are we going to, like, stop meeting ever? And I'm like, well, that's really up to us. And he's like, are we going to have to split? Are we going to have to do this? And I was like, Luke, I mean, not really. And so he had all these questions first. And a couple months into group, um, it was funny because we were kind of sharing the difference. And all the guys in the group, it was awesome. They all had the same response. And it was, um, <laughs> my wife signed us up for small groups because our group meets on Monday night. And we were like, sweet. <laughs> Monday night football, no kids. Not excited for groups, they're going, I'm staying home, because <laughs> I just bought myself a free night. But they all came, and um, they started like, and it was interesting, because I remember one of the light nights, uh, Luke goes, I can't imagine our group ever splitting up. And we're, we're tight, like we are close as a group. Um, we talk about things we shouldn't talk about as a group, to be honest with you. But, I mean, we're close. And it was kind of the sentiment of, I can't ever see our group splitting up. I mean, we're just too good of friends now. And uh, this past summer, we've um, had some time hanging out, and we're kind of prepping up for our new group session. And um, we're sitting around by the pool one day, and Luke goes, our group needs to split. He goes, what? And he goes, no, don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't dislike any of you. But what we have here is too good just to keep it to ourselves. And we're eventually going to have to split because there's some people who need a space and we need to be the ones who are going to make a difference in their life. Do you see that progression? That's from maturity to another level of maturity. And guys, here's the deal. I care so badly about this church. And it's really interesting. Um, we were at a softball tournament yesterday. I know I'm taking up way too much time than I should, but I'll keep going. <laughs> um, a softball tournament yesterday, and I'm seeing a bunch of people. It's the Nazarene National Softball Tournament, which might be news to you. We're kind of a Nazarene church. Um, but uh, so I'm seeing all these different people that I know in the denomination. And um, the, everybody comes up with, like, when you're a pastor, they have this. How's your church? And um, I even had a very traditional guy who goes, how's your flock? <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed at him. I, I wanted to take him serious, but I just laughed at him. <laughs> but it's always that thing. Everybody goes, how's your church? And, and it's so funny because I've never referred to this as my church. This is our church. And, and if anything, all I need to do is get out of the way so those of you who can lead can lead. And um, that's why during the summers, and you're going to see it throughout the year, um, that's why I don't preach a lot of Sundays. And um, I had a friend who was, who was asking me, he's like, how do you do that? He goes, like, if I go 15 minutes, my board comes to me and they tell me they don't pay me for 15 minutes. They pay me for 30. And if I want to check, I'll get it back up to 30. And I go, I mean, I, I'm not here. My role is not to fill time. My role is to put our church in a position and to train people up and grow them up and place people wherever we can so that the kingdom of God will advance and there's some Sundays up front and messages that I'll do that best. And there's a lot of Sundays that other people are going to do that better than me. And so here's our prayer. That our love would abound. That we wouldn't be selfish. That we would move from one level of maturity to the next. And that we would go. That we would go wherever Christ sent us, wherever he asked us, to whoever needed to be reached. That we would be a launching pad of hope, of care, and of love. And this is how we're going to close today. Um, band, if you guys will go ahead and uh, come on up. Um, I want to pray a prayer um, with you. And um, this is how it's going to work. Um, in just a second, I'm, I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads. And um, I'm just going to say a statement. And I would ask that you would make that your prayer. Um, don't say it out loud. I think that's awkward. That's weird. We're not here to chant. <laughs> But just, just pray it to yourself, to God. 
And I would just like to guide you a few steps along the way in this prayer of what our prayer for our church is. And then um, we're going to close with this song that we've really had as our focus over the past two or three weeks and is really the heart of our church. And so um, if you would, if you would just bow your heads. And as I say a statement, I'll leave a second if you'll just pray that back to God. Lord, I thank you for this church. And Lord, I thank you that you saved me. Allow me to be an instrument of hope. Help me to see the selfishness in my life. And replace it with a love for you and your world. Lord, help me move to deeper levels of maturity and send me out. Lord, make me move. I want your kingdom to come. And I want your will to be not my own. Amen. Would you stand and sing the song with us? Exposing all my shame, be perfect in your sight. And death, raised to life, now all my dead is paid. Be perfect sacrifice, and none can fathom your. Our hearts knowing you're changing all of us. So take our hands, make us move. We have found the greatest love for all of us. So take our hands, make us move. We have found the greatest love. For all of us, and we won't let you change this world alone. So make, make us, us move. move.